Hello, everybody. I'm hoping my computer is running fast enough. I have n I'm looking over at OBS on my second monitor. It seems like it's lagging. I'll have to check whenever the video exports. But hopefully this is all doing good. But I am making this video to talk about something that I've been working on and I'm still kind of working on. It is a tabletop role-playing game system and I say game system because it's designed for you to basically use it to base a game off of right uh, what you could use this to it's like a generic system but it's really meant for you to like extend it um, with for use in a setting um, I'll show you I have, this is kind of the basic ass logo I made in Inkscape uh, trying to uh, look like a uh, eight like eight side die uh, looked at you know from the front I think I kind of got the uh, triangle like the triangles on the side I feel like I should probably thin those but whatever it's good enough for now um, but this is basically 1E Draft 1. Um, the reason it is called 4SD8 is because you have four attribute, attributes that all start with the letter S. And it uses dice pools of eight-sided dice. And... Those four attributes that I was talking about just like a few seconds ago. This is strength, speed, smarts, and speech. So strength is your physical prowess, fitness, and durability. Uh, speed is your dexterity and reflexes. Smarts is your knowledge and mental agility. And speech is your social ability. Uh, each attribute ranges from 1 to 5. Which is where three is what an average person in the given setting would have. Um, five is the best, one is the worst, and this is just directly the number of D8 you add to your dice pool when using that attribute. Another way you can think about it is uh, from negative two to plus two, where zero is an average person gives you three D8, and then plus two gives you five, uh, five D8, minus two gives you one D8, but it's a lot easier to, to think about when it's just one to five. It's just a lot easier to think about. Um, there's two ways you can determine your character's attributes. Either you can do point by, where all attributes start as three, and you get two points you can put into any attributes, and then you can get more points by taking them out of attributes. So for example, you know, Everything starts at 3, and you're going for, like, um, a fast, smart build. So, you can put your two points into speed and smarts, and then maybe you decide, you know, not going to be focusing on strength that much, you can take a point out of strength and maybe put that into smarts. That's kind of how that would work. Alternatively, uh, you can do random. Or basically, you roll uh, 4d6, 4d6, I only have one of each die type on my on hand. I need to buy more eventually. But basically you would roll 1d6 and then any with, you know, re-rolling any time it lands on a 6 because the attribute values are from 0 to 5. So, or 1 to 5. So a value 6 is invalid. So you'd re-roll Anytime you get a six, then whatever the va face value is, that's one of your attributes. You just have to figure out which attribute you want that to be. So, let me just as an example. Let me roll. Let me roll this d d six. That's a three. Um. So I'm just gonna say that's going to be my speech, and then uh, that's that's a one. <laughs> I'm gonna put that in strength. I'm 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 weak. <laughs> and then four and sm I'm four. That's gonna be smarts. And then let's see what my speed's gonna be. 
also four. So I got a four in speed as well. So you know, that's it. That's my character. But you don't all you don't just have attributes. You also have skills because you know. I don't want to do a class-based system where you are basically locked into a certain path. I like the skill-based system of things like, well, like Savage Worlds or uh, VTM or early VTM. If it's any uh, World of Darkness storyteller system or uh, Cogent or things like that. And... Most skills, with the exception of perception, are tied to an attribute. So, for example, athletics is tied to strength, sleight of hand is tied to speed, um, investigation is tied to smarts, and persuasion is tied to speech. So that's just for an example. Uh, the only exception is perception. Because that can be used with any attribute, similar to how it works in cogent roleplay. Um, so basically, if you can use speech plus perception to try and look for social cues, or strength plus perception for you know trying to see how strong someone is, stuff like that. Um, and if it doesn't matter, you choose whatever. Honestly, um, each skill ranges from zero to three. And that's just, again, directly the number of D8 you have when rolling using that skill. Uh, so zero means, you know, the character has no experience or knowledge with this skill. While value three is basically you're an expert. You know everything that is that there is to be known, or you've been, yeah, you just basically know everything that needs to be known. Um... Other than that, when it comes to character-specific things, besides maybe inventory, which I'll cover later, is the single derived statistic, which is health. Um, and your maximum health is basically you take your strength attribute, your endurance and stamina skills, and you double all of them. And this gives you a maximum health from 2 to 22. The amount of and damage and stuff like that, I'm going to cover that later in this video, but basically, there's a wound system. Um, I see this. How do we do checks? And basically, as I've kind of alluded to previously, you basically take your attribute and you take your skill. Usually, the game master would call that out. But if you have an idea of what attribute and skill you need, you can suggest that. But generally, the game master would be you know final arbiter on that. They would also tell you how many points you would need. Uh, the difference is how the points are allocated on the D8. So basically, let's say you roll a 1 on... There we go. Let's say you roll a 1. You lost a point. And let's say you rolled a... Trying to get it not right. You rolled a 2 or a 3 or 4. That's 0 points. You didn't get anything from that. Meanwhile, if it is a 5, 7, 5, 6, or 7, that's 1 point. And if you land on a... Na, 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 Eight, that's two points for that die phase. And, of course, that is with the stipulation that your pool's value cannot go below zero. So, if you get all negative ones, that's the same as getting all twos, or all threes, or all fours. It's zero points. That's as low as you can go. I'm not dealing with negative point values. Not doing that. And... The reason why I did this, instead of just having, you know, anything below uh, 5 being 0 and anything 5 or up being 1, is because this basically gives extra stakes, and it also kind of simulates how, like, crits and, like, critical success and critical failures work. So, if you roll an 8, you have 
you're more likely to succeed because you're getting more points. But if you roll like one, you're less likely to succeed because it's going to negate one of the points you already got. Yeah. So that's kind of how uh, checks work. But sometimes you need to do a. Ch you want to follow somebody? I'm recording. Oh. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. That was my father. Um, sometimes you need to do a check for an action that goes against some other uh, character, whether it's a player character or a which. It sh probably shouldn't be a player character, but I've heard stories of uh, Game Masters running uh, campaigns where you have two teams of players going against each other. So that is a possibility. Um, but yeah. If you need to do a, a role against somebody else as a contest, in that case... Both sides roll a dice pool. And that's usually with the same combination of attribute and skill, but depending on the circumstances, it might be different. So, for example, in combat, you'd probably be using the same skill, uh, skill and attribute. But in, like, say, you're sneaking around and someone has potential uh, to perceive you, you would be rolling speed plus uh, stealth, while they would be running, a, I say, smart plus perception. So that would be that. But basically, similar to how it works in Cogent, I've been pulling a lot of coat from Cogent, the outcome is determined by the difference between the two dice pools. So if you both have the same amount of points, it's a tie. Otherwise... If someone has more points, they win. That's kind of how that works. And also, kind of stole how assists work from Kojin. Um, basically, yeah, assists. So one person needs to do a check. Somebody else wants to help them with that check. Uh, and to do that, they do a separate check usually with a different attribute skill with a lower target point number and I've done the same thing of limiting it to the minimum of three points because again it works like in cogent more points over the target means points given to the assisted however if you go below the target you take away points so that's a thing you got to consider it's a double-edged sword. Sure, you can help your friends, but you can also screw up. Do you want to take that risk? Sometimes it'll be worth it. It's honestly up to you and your players. Um, also, combat. At the beginning of a combat event, you have to figure out turn order or initiative. And, again, I'm stealing a lot from Kojin here, but it's based off of someone's speed. So if two, so higher speed equals, you know, get you to do your turn first, kind of. I've just taken a lot of things from how cogent works. Um, so if two characters have the same speed, each rolls one d eight. Whoever's die has the highest face value is because it'll be faster for that combat event. And if you rolled the same thing, just roll it again. It, not that big of a deal. Uh, for And similar to Cogent, again, for each round of combat, all participants declare actions in reverse speed order. And then you perform your actions in forward speed, o speed, or the speed order. So the fastest cl character declares last goes first, or acts first. Um, each character, I was really going to do just one action per round, but eventually what I decided one is two minor actions and one major action per round maximum. So a minor action would be anything that can be performed without doing a dice roll, while a major action requires a dice roll. So a minor action would be like reloading a weapon, moving, equipping gear, stuff like that. 
while major acts would be like climbing a wall while trying to heal, heal someone or fisticuffs, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. And by minute, I mean like right now. Com combat roles take the form of contested roles. Generally, when it comes to melee combat, both sides' roles represent the corresponding character's attack and defense. Meanwhile, for raged, ra rage, ranged combat, one side is purely rolling attack and the other is purely, purely rolling defense. Assuming that they're you know far from each other, right? They aren't in melee range. So, the form the defense roll takes depends on how the defensive side is attempting to defend themselves. Basically, dodging would be speed plus reflexes, while attempting to tank it is strength plus endurance. I don't know why you'd want to attempt to tank it, but that's an option. Um, for melee combat rolls, the side with the most points wins the roll and inflicts a wound, this just later on, upon the opponent. For ranged combat rolls, a wound is only inflicted if the attacker wins, otherwise nothing happens. As for how positioning works, it's kind of an abstract system. Somebody gave me the idea in the tabletop role-playing game development Discord server to use note cards, index cards, to represent abstract distances in a sense. So there's four distance ranges. So the of close range, which is basically melee combat. So if two of the index cards are almost touching each other, they're close. Uh, so melee combat as well as other actions that require being close can occur. Uh, then there's near. So if two note cards are barely separate, like they're still close by, but they're not as close as close, they're near. So throwable weapons as well as short range weapons like bows or handguns can be used in combat. If you're far if you're decently separated, the two characters are far from each other. This means that long range weapons such as rifles or shotguns can be used. And then you have very far away. If two note cards are practically on the separate ends of the table, the two characters are very far from each other. This means that extremely long-range weapons, such as sniper rifles or rocket launchers, can be used in combat. Of course, you can use a long-range weapon in a smaller range than it's able to. Just, you know, don't fire a rocket launcher at point blank. It sounds fun, but you're going to die. <laughs> Straight up. So, also... How moving works, because I mentioned that moving uses a minor action. Moving from one distance range to the next one closest or farthest equals a minor action. So that means, since you have two minor actions, you can use both of them to move from, say, um, close to far or near to very far. If you want to move farther than that, which would mainly be like going from close to very far or very far to close, that would be a roll. That would be a major action. You need to roll speed plus stamina. But now that that's taken care of, I can talk about how wounds and damage work. Wounds are generally divided into four severities because of how contested rolls work, the maximum point difference is 16 points. So, to make things more... Uh, what's the word? To make things more easy to work with, instead of just using that directly, it's split into four severity levels, which I'll cover a four-point difference range. So, there's superficial wounds, which you can get if the difference in points is from 1 to 4. These are just a single point of health damage and have no side effects, usually. And these are generally going to heal between play sessions. But an ally can also heal immediately using smarts plus healing. There's also worrying runes, which are occur when a, the point difference is from 5 to 8. These are two points of damage and add a 1d8 penalty to an attribute until it's healed. These wounds need to be healed using smarts healing. And then 
that's kind of the thing with serious and critical. They all need to be, those two also need to be healed with smarts plus healing. The difference is serious wounds are from 9 to 12 point differences, 3 points of damage, and a negative, uh, not a negative 2, a 2d8 penalty to an attribute. Critical wounds are 4 points of damage if you have a point difference from 13 to 16, and a 3d8 penalty to an attribute. Um, and of course, one note, if your attribute is, you know, 1d8 or a penalty would reduce it beyond 1d8 it fl it floors out at 1d8 you always have to have at least one dice in an attribute so but obviously you can take damage there's a risk there if a character takes a wound that causes their health to become zero or even go into negatives they're down a downed character cannot take actions, at least regular actions, and has to roll a strength plus endurance death save if they take another wound. If they fail, then they're dead. An ally can attempt to heal them using smarts plus healing. There's that again. If they succeed the roll with exactly enough points to hit the target number, the downed character is stabilized. So they don't have to take a death save for the next wound that they take. If they succeed with more points, then the down character is healed to some amount, determined by the difference from the target number of points, and the... Yeah. And that amount is generally going to be up to Game Master Interpretation, and the character can return to action. Now let's go on to how I'm handling inventory. Generally, inventory is divided into three categories. You have gear, currency, and resources. So gear would be individual items that are specific to a character, like their weapons, their armor, or some little trinket that they use. Um... Some might have durability. That's kind of an optional mechanic that you can take part in. Um, oh, and gear would also include things like keys, stuff like that. The total amount of gear you can carry is one more than whatever your strength attribute is. That might change. All of this might change. This is just a draft. I haven't even played this anything yet. I need to come up with a setting. Um, if you choose to do durability, then gear has four condition levels. Good, decent, poor, and broken. All gear starts out in good condition, unless there's a good narrative reason to be for it to be in worse condition. Anytime you fail a roll where a piece of gear is involved, you have to roll a d8. Let me grab it again. I have to roll a d8. If it's in good condition, you have to roll a 5 or above. If it's in decent condition, it has to be 6 or above. If it's in poor condition, it has to be 7 or above. If the roll reaches or exceeds the target number, the gear stays in the same condition. Otherwise, it drops down a condition level. Gear can be directly targeted and damaged on a success in combat. Once gear is broken... It cannot be used unless it is fixed via a smart plus repair check. If broken gear is damaged again, it is broken beyond... Where, where did, ah, there it is. It went on my tied pad. If broken gear is damaged again, it is broken beyond repair and cannot be fixed by even the best repair people. So, if you use durability, there's that risk that you might lose gear forever. Gear can also be fixed when they're in poor or decent condition, um, and that probably have a lower target number. Gear can, so a successful check on, on uh, smart plus repair increases the gear's condition level by one or up to three if it was a greater success. So why use gear? Well, Armor provides damage negation that is depleted when hit and is reset between battles. Kind of like, well, like AC, I think. So, let's say you have, like, 
an ar some piece of armor that gives you like two points AC. You take a if you take a worrying wound, you just completely negate that, but you're out of armor for the rest of the battle. Weapons, they can have certain ad like advantages or effects. For example, spears or something similar can be thrown at the enemy. So things like bows and guns have range. Grenades and rockets do area of effect damage. Also, if you roll at least one eight and succeed a roll with a weapon, some can crit. Which is that's what that is. So if you have a dagger or a knife, it can ignore armor on a crit. And spears can push an enemy back on a crit. And other equipment can have other effects and optionally crit. So that'd be kind of up to the setting or your GM if they homebrew stuff. And that's gear. Then you have currency. These are basically just things that are used for commerce. Uh, depending on the group, you can optionally share some of your currency with the party. In that case, that shared currency is treated as a resource. Otherwise, it's treated as a personal thing to each character and is tracked on the character sheet. Instead of tracking exact amounts of currencies like D&D does, currency is abstracted to like eight wealth levels. Each wealth level is, is a significant amount compared to the previous wealth level. For example, if you're in a science fiction setting with a currency called credits, obtaining a single credit when you had none would increase your wealth rather. Well, wealth level. My mouth is not mouthing. Ah. However, you would need to attain anywhere from 99 to 999 credits in order to reach the next wealth level. That and the exact amounts don't really matter. That's just kind of an example. When you spend currency on something, either the player or the game master needs to roll 1d8 to determine whether or not that purchase is expensive enough to drop the character down a wealth level. Similarly, when acquiring currency, you have to roll 1d8 to determine whether you rise up by another wealth rather. Wealth level. My mouth. Can you please work? Ah. If you're on a wolf level of zero, which is, you know, nothing, you don't even need to roll when you're acquiring currency because you have a 100% shot of going up a wolf level because it's very easy to go up from nothing. However, if you're at wolf level seven and you're trying to reach wealth level eight, that's extremely difficult because you're already super rich. It's hard to get even richer because, you know, magnitude. Uh, so you'd have to have the die land on an 8. Losing wealth is kind of different. It's a bell curve. You can't lose wealth when you have nothing. And if you're super rich, then most losses of wealth are a drop in the bucket. But if you're in the middle, it's kind of easy. So here's how the world works. <laughs> There's also resources. These are just things that are shared with the entire party, such as food, ammunition, or crafting materials. Similar to currencies, these are represented via abstract stock levels. Since these are shared with the entire party, they're checked on a party sheet. Resort are the only thing I can think of to track on this sheet, but you can also write down the name of the party, and if the campaign or the setting has other mechanics that involve the entire party can track those too. Um, also, thievery! Sometimes people steal things. Sometimes it's due to desperation. Other times it's due to greed. And other times you just really need that key sticking out of that guard's pocket. Come on. I know you want it. Let's come take it. Still stealing is a roll of speed plus sleight of hand. If anyone is nearby that could reasonably spot you, or if you're trying to pickpocket someone, there's a contest of speed plus sleight of hand versus perception. 
If you roll enough points, you get to take any gear, currency, or resources with a value dictated by the difference from your roll to either the target number or the opposing roll. If, you're, if your gear, currency, or resources are stolen, the stolen gear must be removed from your inventory and the currency or resource must be reduced by a certain number of wealth or stock levels. So yeah, you can steal, you can also get stolen from. That's a thing that can happen. Also, progression. During gameplay, you're generally going to want your characters to get better. Obviously, this can ha be handled by getting better gear, but you also want to improve your skills or your attributes sometimes, too. <coughs> this is handled by Inspiration. I stole the name from Dungeons & Dragons, but it's not used the same way. You have Minor Inspiration, which is used to improve skills, and if a setting adds any additional mechanics... This can be used to improve those as well. And my a major aspiration is only used to improve attributes, and it's equivalent to five points of minor inspiration. Generally, if you're a game master, you should give out minor inspiration whenever the party completes side quests or survives a combat event, just not all the time and not a lot of Major inspiration should be given out sparingly, only when major events or objectives are completed. So basically, just use your best judgment, but don't go crazy with it. There's just the numbers don't work out that way. You, yeah. In order to use inspiration, a player needs to indicate what their character is going to improve and how they're going to improve it. The character will then be doing that between this session and the next. Inspiration cannot be used to increase something above its maximum, so you can't go above 5 for an attribute or above 3 for skill. So that kind of makes sense. And that's kind of all I have figured out right now. I do need to figure out a setting to use with this system, because by itself, it's... Yeah, it's just kind of meant for your use as a core. If I can figure out a setting and make some rules, some extended rules for it, I'm going to have to try and figure out how to play test. Uh, that'll probably have to be done over the internet. But doing some play testing would be good. I can figure out what works, what what doesn't, um, and just generally work on things. And yeah, that's kind of something I need to do. So if you have an idea for a setting and want to extend this rule set for use with that setting, you can go for it, you can go play test, and tell me what you think about the system. I need feedback. That's kind of something I need. Um, alternatively, you just want to use this as a core rule set. Um, or for like a like not but any others, just use these rules. That's also fine. But if you're running this with people, Remember, this is a draft. This is a this is the first draft of the system. So, if there's anything that you find doesn't work well, or things that you feel work a little too well, tell me. I need information in order to know what to do. Thank you. And, yeah, just thank you for your time listening to me ramble about a project. Um... Uh, also, if you have any ideas for settings, I would absolutely take that. I know one idea I had, which I need to flush out, is basically formerly cyberpunk, currently post-apocalypse. So, thinking of something along, along the lines of, you know, corporation makes something, and it goes very bad, and now humanity's in a very bad state. I would like for uh, Cybernetics and stuff to still work, but there to be some huge risk to having cybernetics um if i go that route i might think of a better sis a uh, better setting or something like that but that's just kind of what i'm going around with in my head um but yeah um uh, if you have any suggestions or feedback or really anything drop it in the comments if you if you like this system you like the idea or you just like my silly ass uh just hit the like button if you don't like my silly ass or you don't like the system or you just some thing that irks you uh hit the dislike button i'll see that nobody else will 
uh, unless they have uh, the return YouTube dislikes uh, feature enabled. Um, if you like, if you like this a lot and want to get updates, I'd say definitely subscribe. Whenever I do get to the point of doing uh, play tests, I'll probably end up recording them and uploading them uh, with the player's permission, obviously. Because um, obviously I'm not going to record people without their permission, even though Louisiana is technically a one-party consent state. And uh, that's, I, mean, I can't guarantee that everybody else is also in Louisiana because they're most likely not. Um, so I'm definitely going to ask for permission before recording people. <laughs> you know, cause that's how, that's how, that's how consent works. That's how privacy works. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for, you know, spending your time listening to me. Um, and have an awesome day. Yeah. Yeah, just have an awesome day. Um. Yeah, and let's just, yeah, we are in the void now. Yeah. Just probably gonna put some end screen stuff here. But yeah, uh, if you, yeah. Like if you like, dislike if you dislike, comment if you have any ideas, suggestions, or feedback. Um, subscribe if you want to. I'm not gonna force you. And you have an awesome day. Bye.